Hello everyone and welcome to session three of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Randy Henderson and I am one of the Black Feminist Reading Circle members of this online group. This session runs from January 20th until June 2nd and includes two week long breaks. Our democratically selected reading material is Harriet A. Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Our book group meets each Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8 on the Google Plus Hangouts on Air platform. You may find the, Glo the Global Black Feminist Reader Circle on Google Plus, YouTube, and Facebook. And always feel free to join us in reading our story together. So this evening we're going to summarize and discuss Chapter 1, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present by Harriet Washington. We'll start off by introducing ourselves. Okay, who wants to introduce yourself? I'm Kim. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. My name is Georgette Moses, and I'm participating from Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm glad we're on Chapter 1. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it, our discussion tonight. Welcome to the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Michelle Odom. I'm one of the co-hosts of the group and I am located in New York City. I think if Vanita is not able to come back in, then I will go ahead and moderate tonight's discussion. This is session three, meaning it's our third book uh, that we're reading, and this session is running from January 20th through June 9, 2015. Chapter 1, Southern Discomfort, Medical Exploitation on the Plantation. In Chapter 1, Southern Discomfort, Medical Exploitation on the Plantation, author Harriet A. Washington offers an overview of early medicine in the American South. She briefs readers on the beliefs, practices, and conditions in which doctors and African Americans encountered one another. She identifies the shared economic interests doctors held with planters and how this common bond undermined the health of and instilled the fear of medicine, or iatrophobia, in Black Americans, a fear that exists to this day. Primarily focused in the 17 and 1800s, this chapter describes the deplorable public health practices of the era, which only worsened circumstances for the enslaved population. We also learn a bit about scientific racism or the use of scientific techniques and hypotheses to support or justify the belief in racism, racial inferiority, or racial superiority, or alter alternatively, the practice of classifying individuals of different phenotypes into discrete races. One doctor, for example, Josiah Knott, MD, theorized that the distinctive knee joint and long heel of the black man proved he had been created as a submissive knee bender, a servant to whites. Another leading voice was that of Samuel A. Cartwright, MD, who identified conditions afflicting blacks such as drapetomania or an insane urge to escape from slavery. Oh. With pseudoscientific and biblical justifications in place, planters and medical practitioners freed themselves to administer a series of inhumane treatments to cure a variety of real and imagined diseases and conditions. Fortunately, some enslaved people held on to African beliefs and practices which provided some relief for those who were ill and often taught those, these skills to Western practitioners. Okay, uh, C. 
One complaining woman was treated with a cow skin or hickory switch to scar her. Other doctors recommended that an owner apply nine drops of essence of rawhide or oil of hickory to the back of a sick slave. Bring me that hickory switch is something many black people living today recall hearing during childhood. How can we be sure when we spank our children, we are not helping to perpetuate practices taught to us by slave masters? That's a great question. It sure is. It sure is. Because we got the whip. We, we got the switch. I mean, we're coming up, we got the switch. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother, my mother liked the switch, mm -hmm. you know. I don't know, I guess, for me, I guess the answer to that question is we, we actually are helping to perpetuate practices taught to us by slave masters. So, I don't think that we can be sure that we're not doing that. You know, I mean, children tend to give the impression that they need some discipline. You know, I have a grown son, and I used to say to him, "You just you you begging for it, aren't you?" <laughs> <laughs> It is hard to see their behavior as anything other than just come on and whoop me. <laughs> but, oh my God. <sighs> I do think really I do think at some point we need to um, really think about where some of these some of these behaviors and, and attitudes that we have toward each other including our children where they come from. Vanita was saying earlier today that her grandmother used to always use the word malingering you know and um, I, I wasn't around my grandparents very much, so I don't know. I, I don't think my parents used that, that word. But my mother would, would, would pull a hickory switch <laughs> on you, you know. And I think we just, you know, we have to start making ourselves, forcing ourselves to be conscious of of what we're doing and why we're doing it and figuring out you know if there's some other way to accomplish the same goal you know if it's if it's instilling a lesson if it's administering discipline you know how do we how do we learn other ways of of doing those things because I think we don't really know what damage we're doing. So. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's um, one of the one of the images that I included in the highlights video for this week. It's um it's an illustration. It's the one that has the the naked person with I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman really, but I was trying to give that image of the pregnant woman with her belly in the dirt and being whipped. Well, the person holding the whip is a black man. And you know, and and I think we have to to come to grips with how we have learned to treat each other, including our children. But, you know, as I have been on this 
um, cultural journey. Honestly, it, it feels like I got picked up by a starship and, <laughs> and shipped off <laughs> to an island, or to, to a space somewhere in space. I, I can't even describe half the stuff I've seen. But for the most part, it was black people. It was it was black people that were treating other black people in 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 ways that are just really cruel and ways that they certainly would not want to be treated themselves. And I just you know I think we have to really get in the habit of thinking about what what damage has been done to us as a result of of our experiences as black people in this country and and how we have learned to be so hurtful toward each other and how our powerlessness seems to have created this need to express power whenever and wherever and however we can. Mm -hmm. And very often the only opportunity that we have to express power is over another black person um, who has been made vulnerable in some way by imprisonment, by homelessness, poverty. And so, you know, it just adds another layer of hurt and oppression when um, when it is a black person that seems to be taking actual pleasure in in being hurtful to vulnerable people. So you know a lot of this comes out of our slave experience, and it's time for it to stop.